Look, welcome everyone and thank you for foreshortening your morning tea to come and have a listen. I'm uh, delighted to give you a, a flying overview this morning of um, some, I guess, practical skin cancer prevention handy hints. So what do we want to protect ourselves against? Well, the common varieties of skin cancer, this one, basal cell cancer or BCC, will affect almost half of us here in Australia at some point in our lives. And they don't spread to other bits of us and kill us, but gee, they're annoying. And they tend to happen on bits of us where we least want to have surgery. This is the corner of the nose. Here's one on the top of the nose there. The true extent of this very sneaky infiltrating BCC was only apparent at surgery. So this is a huge problem and you can imagine if you're getting not just one of these, which is bad enough, but tons of them regularly, frequently, it's, it's a huge burden of disease in Australia. We'd like to be able to prevent sunspots or actinic keratosis, these scaly things that more than half of us over the age of 40 have in Australia. Occasionally, they can kick on and progress to become squamous cell cancer. This is our second most common type of skin cancer, and these do have metastatic potential. They can sometimes spread to lymph nodes and other bits of the body. This was a particularly evil SCC. Within six months, this poor man had died of multiple bony mets, nodal mets, lung mets, everything. So SCCs, we never trust them. They can turn very, very bad. So it'd be lovely to prevent some of those. And it'd be wonderful if we could try and reduce the incidence of melanoma. The little uh, picture down the bottom right there is to remind us that not all melanomas are brown and black. Pink is the new black. About 10% of them are hypopigmented or amelanotic, and they can be harder to detect sometimes, which means they're often thicker when they're diagnosed. So we want to prevent all of those things. And of course, we want to prevent the short-term damaging effects of UV radiation as well, which can end up as those skin cancers later in life. Um, Teenagers, they're so difficult to get any message through to. They really are. Um, here's a 15-year-old whose mother's a dermatologist. It's <laughs> such a good look for me. And I will confess, that's not his first sunburn. Yeah, Mum, I know, I know, I know. And, and look, I mean, at home, we call him the genius. Um, he, he just um, is hard to get through to. And this is, this is a huge problem, that if, if he can't do the right thing, how are we getting the message to other teenagers? When we talk about skin cancer prevention and sun protection, please, please don't forget your eyes, okay? This is sunburned eyeball, very unpleasant, but in the longer term, of course, we get cataracts from UV exposure, we get these horrible pterygia that grow across your eye, um, removal doesn't look very pleasant, and we get skin cancers around the eye. That's a BCC, that's a bigger BCC. They can be fixed, but they're really challenging for your oculoplastics guys to, to fix, okay? So don't forget the eyes. Wrap around sunglasses, help reduce the reflected radiation that gets you from the side of the glasses. So wraparounds are essential. And of course, photo aging. Be lovely to reduce the signs of time. I mean, if I hadn't grown up uh, cooking myself on the mid-north coast, I would look more like this today and less like this. Um, although because I'll be getting my cataracts anytime soon, it probably doesn't matter terribly much. So, how is UV damaging our skin? Essentially, UV radiation damages the DNA in our skin. Now, as long as we've got plenty of cellular energy on hand, plenty of fuel, your body's really good at repairing that DNA and it all ends well. The problem is that UV radiation not only damages our DNA, but it actively depletes cells of energy at the time when they're in greatest need. And DNA repair, not so good and that's when we get mutations appearing. Now, all of that unrepaired DNA damage lurking in the skin is also a trigger for the immune suppressive effects of sunlight. So sunlight profoundly weakens your skin's ability to seek and destroy tumors, okay? So if you've got UV immune suppression mutations, that's a recipe for skin cancer. DNA damage does not require a sunburn. It can and it does happen after as little as one third of a minimally sunburning dose. And UVA, which doesn't burn us too much, does also cause DNA damage as well. So we need to protect against both. This is a cross section of human skin, the epidermis there at the top. No DNA damage in unexposed skin. We have a special stain for certain types of DNA damage. This is after less than a sunburn threshold of UV in normal skin, so lots and lots of damage. Not a problem if we repair the damage, but as we get older, our ability to do that decreases. And we now know 
that people who've had skin cancer seem to have a more global deficiency in their DNA repair, okay? And that's important because there is now good evidence from different parts of the world that if you've had a skin cancer, particularly if you got your first skin cancer at an early age, you have a hugely increased risk of all other cancers, okay? Brain, blood, bone, lung, breast, bowel, whatever. If you're unlucky enough to get your first skin cancers in your early 20s, the risk is more than 14-fold higher than for people who haven't had skin cancer. And even if we wait till our 60s for the first skin cancer, we still have a 25% increased risk. Very important for our skin cancer patients to make sure they're all up to date with all appropriate cancer screening. So what about the immune system? It's suppressed, UV suppresses our skin immunity. This fuels skin cancer. What about people who are walking around for years with profound levels of immune suppression? This is our transplant patients who are on immune suppressive medication to stop organ rejection. These are our chronic leukemia, chronic lymphoma patients who may look well, but their immune system is not able to cope and these people are at extreme risk of skin cancer. Practical hint, handy hint, UV radiation is a key trigger for cold sore, so a little bit of sunscreen on the face and lips will substantially reduce the rate of cold sore recurrence. Now, hats are good. So how are we going to protect ourselves? Hats are great, but they only give you a very limited level of protection for the lower parts of the face. Uh, this was a school project by the non-sunburnt child who is keen to protect her skin. So we need sunscreen as well, and we love sunscreens. Within just a few months, someone with lots of keratosis can reduce the number of scaly things on their face by 30 to 40 per cent. Okay, even people in their 80s and 90s, you can see it, you can feel the difference, it's fabulous. Squamous cell cancer, reduced by 40% within two years. So not 20 years, not a lifetime, within just two years, which blink of an eye, really. And in the longer term, other cancers are reduced as well. So, very, very important. People say, oh, it's too late, what's the point? It isn't too late. Eight or 80, you can get practical, real-world benefits within a really short time frame from using sunscreen each day. They do need to make contact with the skin in order to be effective. Uh, and this is the tricky bit, I think. Um, I, I love the fact that this family shares a number of genetic issues, um, as well as the tendency to sunburn. Um, although I can't talk, can I really now? I've, I've fessed up. So in real life, we put on about a third of the amount of sunscreen that we would use in the laboratory setting to test sunscreen. So we put a third of the amount on, we sweat, we don't reapply the sunscreen, we are exposed to a different mix of UV in the real world than in the laboratory. So the real life SPF is probably less than half of what the laboratory SPF uh, that you'll see on the label, okay? So start with a good high SPF and it needs to cover both UVA and UVB. SPF is still a good way to rank the efficiency of different products, but you never ever use it to calculate how long can I be outside before something bad happens. You don't do that. You use the sunscreen to reduce the total amount of UV exposure. So how are we going to get people to put their sunscreen on? Uh, even a lot of my platinum frequent flyers are very non-compliant with sunscreen. It shouldn't be hard, but they are. So compliance is a, is a big thing. I tell all of them to use a, an SPF 50 broad spectrum sunscreen, at least on the face, every single day. Every morning, you brush your teeth. I mean, you hope that toothbrushing is an established habit um, by this point. And if you put the sunscreen next to the toothpaste in the bathroom, that can help you to remember to put the sunscreen on every day. So it, it's a no brainer. You don't even need to think about it anymore. And that will hopefully reduce the amount of work you need to remedy skin cancers and sunspots. And don't forget the sunglasses. Now, what about men? Um, men are different. They are different. We know that they're immunologically weaker than women. They get less autoimmune disease, good for them, but they get man flu, and, and they get other things that, represent, that reflect their immune suppression. They're more susceptible to sunlight-induced immune suppression, and they get more cancers than women, and they get worse cancers than women. So mortality from a given cancer is worse if you're a man than if you're a woman, okay? So we need to work hard on them. And how are we going to get them to put sunscreen on? Well, it's an ongoing battle, but I found that there's a, a language that may increase our chance of success. 
You would never ever tell a man to protect his skin, pointless, he must defend it. You never ever say, now this cream will make your skin softer, it will make it stronger. Never tell someone to cover up, they must shield. And you never say that you do anything for skin health, it is always for skin fitness. And then, you know, even the, the old skin check, sometimes it needs a little bit of spicing up as well. So in this world, we do what we can to try and get people to do the right thing. And what if people are doing the right thing, but their skin's still rubbish and they're growing tons of skin cancers, then they might need a whole body treatment, a systemic intervention, some chemo prevention. So a few years ago, we wanted to try and find something that was non-toxic, effective, affordable, that might help our highest risk patients. And we came across something called nicotinamide. It's a form of vitamin B3. And we knew it reduced skin cancers and other damage in mice. So we thought, yeah, what about humans? Unlike nicotinic acid or niacin, which is also a type of B3, this one doesn't make you have horrible flushing. So it's very well tolerated. And essentially, it's a precursor of cellular energy. So it's like Gatorade for cells. That's, I think, its main function. Remember our skin with the UV damage? When that skin has had a little bit of nicotinamide on it, there's a significant reduction in damage because the skin is able to more effectively and efficiently repair damaged DNA, okay? So we knew it helped with DNA repair. We showed that it helped with immune suppression in humans. The next step was to do a uh, phase three study to see if it can actually practically help people reduce their numbers of skin cancer. So this was an RPA-led study where almost 400 people at high risk of skin cancer were given nicotinamide or a matched placebo for 12 months. We counted how many new skin cancers grew. We counted their sunspots. We cross-checked for safety. And at the end of it all, we found that in this extreme risk group, the nicotinamide reduced cancers by about a quarter. So it didn't go the whole way, but it did significantly reduce the burden of new cancers for this skin, uh, skin cancer group. Reduced their keratoses, um, but when they stopped taking the tablet, everything went back to normal transmission. And I guess that makes sense because this is like cellular energy, it's fuel, cut off the fuel supply, the skin will go back to its normal state. This was published and the message has really gone around the world, which means that most of our patients have heard about this now. So it's out there. It's not for everyone. If you haven't had a skin cancer or you've just had one BCC ever, this is not for you. It's high doses of a, a medication, really. I think of it more as a pharmacological thing. It's not just a little vitamin supplement. It's high doses and it's forever. So it's for people who've already had lots of skin cancers, who have a disease and need a treatment. Okay, and we still need sunscreens and all the rest. Now, what about our transplant patients? They get so much more skin cancer because their immune system's gone. Okay, so 50 to 100 fold increase in numbers of SCCs, it's massive. Increase in other skin cancers as well. Worse skin cancer, okay? More chance of the cancer coming back after treatment, more chance of it spreading to other bits of the body, and sadly, much more chance of it dying. If you have a heart transplant and you get through your first 10 years and your heart is fabulous, your biggest risk of dying is skin cancer. Okay, so it's a huge problem. How do we save these people from their own skin? Regular surveillance, you can't do without that. And we need the patients to be doing regular surveillance as well as us. If they find something nasty in between visits, they need a friendly, accessible, easy pathway to enable them to come in and see us at short notice. And at RPA, we have dedicated dermatology transplant clinics every week just for these people where we can get them in at short notice and do the needful, okay? It's no good finding something and then you're on the two month waiting list, okay? We need rapid action. And the patients need to know how to reduce their risk further and you need to keep repeating the education message again and again. Yeah, what about nicotinamide? Could that help? Don't know. We're currently in the middle of an RPA-led study, a phase three study, to see if nicotinamide will help this extreme risk group as well as people with normal immunity. And we've got a range of transplant patients from around the country who are currently taking uh, nicotinamide or placebo for 12 months. And again, similar sort of setup as the on-track study. We check for safety, we check their skin, and we count how many skin cancers they grow during the 12 months and whether it's safe to use. And these are medically very complex patients. They get sick all the time. 
no immunity. I don't think they should be taking nicotinamide except in the setting of a clinical trial. So the studies that I've shown you today have been the work of many people over many years, and I'm very, very grateful to that. And I guess if there's one little handy hint that I'd like you to remember after today, it's that it's not all a done deal from early in life. Skin cancer prevention is, it's something that works at any age. Um, we can see the benefits within a really short period of time. Thank <laughs> you.